I'm, uh, I'm delighted to uh, be here and um, to be the first speaker. And there's a little bit of background for the conference, but first I have to uh, start because my, my wife, Tasha, said that the speaker should introduce themselves. So I'll introduce myself thus. When I was uh, young, my, my best friend and I, you know, got into mischief as boys do. And one day his mother said to my mother, the real problem with Adrian is that Adrian comes up with these bad ideas and then my son does them. So we know whose fault it is. And I, I didn't think that was fair at all. He came up with his share of bad ideas and he deserved credit. Um, so I say that because I was involved in that group in Chalice that uh, came up with the idea that, uh, you know, we really should have a conference and address some of these issues. And my best friend, my wife, uh, well, she took the bad idea and ran with it. But I think it was a great idea. And so uh, if, there's, if there's blame to be had, um, the blame is for uh, doing something that I consider to be really good and marvelous and important. And the theme of this conference today is rescuing the restoration. And I want to make clear that that was picked because we feel the restoration of the gospel is in grave danger. It needs rescuing and largely is in that situation due to what's happened with the various churches that have sprung from the restoration. So whatever your belief system is, I'd like to uh, at least ask you to recognize we're starting from the perspective that the restoration of the gospel was genuine was a bona fide attempt by the God of the universe to put truth into the world for our betterment, for our salvation. And as is always the case, unfortunately, uh, apostasy has crept in and the restoration of the gospel at this point and the churches that have sprung from it have become something very different than what they were and what they were intended to be under Joseph Smith. And so... Here we all find ourselves in a world of increasing turmoil and increasing difficulty and a lot of questions. And I think that many of you may be here because you have encountered troubles, doubts, fears, concerns, questions, things about the church that you find difficult. And that's okay. In fact, that's a good sign for all of us. And we'll talk more about that. But the fact that we have questions and concerns should not be the problem. Unfortunately, too, too often when we encounter things that trouble us, uh, we get labeled as having a quote-unquote faith crisis, and it's a widespread problem. I could quote a lot of facts and statistics, uh, things that are going on within the church that perhaps are um, troublesome, that are headed in the wrong direction, uh, but that's really not the point. Rather than looking at the problem, the real point is to talk about what may be troubling you. Now, there's no shortage of information you can find that will give you things to trouble about. Book of Abraham, First Vision, Polygamy, the Priesthood Ban, uh, issues with temples, church finances, the church's response to the COVID situation, Book of Mormon issues, doctrinal issues, policy changes, historical dishonesty, women and priesthood, follow the prophet, patterns of abuse, patriarchy, it goes on and on. And there's no shortage of information out there attempting to tell you that, well, because of X, Y, or Z problem, you should give up faith and potentially not just in the restoration of the gospel, potentially all faith in anything, unfortunately. And to compound the problem, those of us who have had questions who have found information that disturbed us, who have been troubled, have done, well, what we were taught to do and what was the logical thing to do. And too often we've gone to church leaders, uh, people in authority, with our questions and with our problems. And sometimes that doesn't go so well. Rather than having answers, rather than being able to help us through the situation, rather than having studied these things through and come to conclusions that will help us, too often you get told, the problem is you. 
You shouldn't have questions. You shouldn't doubt. In fact, you need to doubt your doubts before you doubt your faith, however one does that. In other words, your doubts are not important. You need to toe the line and put all that aside, or else you're not being faithful. You're an apostate. And unfortunately, that doesn't work either. If the questions are real, they need to be addressed. They're not going to go away. So you have, um, well, things like this comic. Of course you're allowed to ask questions. Here's the list of approved questions. (laughs) You're absolutely free to study and investigate for yourself. Here's a list of approved sources. And uh, we're not trying to stifle thought. We want you to learn everything you can as you reach the approved conclusions. (laughs) And so, stuck in that box, we, uh, we find that too many end up in a real crisis. And that's what we'd like to address today. Now, when we're troubled, we don't find a lot of comfort. We may go to church leaders, we may go to these sources, we don't get answers, and we walk away even more troubled than we were before. And I want to point out at the beginning that that's a good thing. It's a good thing if we find information that troubles us. That's okay. Here's a quote from C.S. Lewis I've always particularly liked. He says, of course, I quite agree that the Christian religion is, in the long run, a thing of unspeakable comfort. But it does not begin in comfort. It begins in dismay, I've been describing, and it is no use at all trying to go on to that comfort without first going through the dismay. In religion, as in war and everything else, comfort is the one thing you cannot get by looking for it. If you look for truth, you may find comfort in the end. If you look for comfort, you will get you will not get either comfort or truth, only soft soap and wishful thinking to begin with, and in the end, despair. And so the fact that uh, we are uncomfortable is the beginning of all growth, is the beginning of what can ultimately guide us to greater answers, to a greater relationship with the Lord, and to greater blessings than we thought possible. And this stuff is important. If, as we're taught, Your eternal salvation is at stake, and it is. You have the right, you have the obligation to ask questions and to sort it out for yourself. You have the right to an informed faith. And anyone who tells you otherwise is wrong. Nobody has the right to be the gatekeeper of what information you are allowed to investigate. The keeper of the gate is, after all, the Holy One of Israel. And he employeth no servant there. There is none other way, save it be by the gate for he cannot be deceived, for the Lord God is his name. And whoso knocketh to him will he open. This is a promise to you. But it also follows up the wise and the learned and they that are rich, who are puffed up because of their learning and their wisdom and their riches. Yea, they are they whom he despiseth. And save they shall cast these things away and consider themselves fools before God and come down in the depths of humility. He will not open unto them from 2 Nephi 9. Therefore, you have the right, you have the obligation to seek out answers for yourself and to seek those answers from whatever sources you deem appropriate. Ultimately, the greatest source is seeking those answers from God directly. Indeed, that was how the restoration of the gospel began with Joseph Smith seeking answers from God directly. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. If any scripture is the foundation of the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is that from James. And if that's the foundation, it teaches us the foundation truth, and that is that you have the right to obtain truth from God. Indeed, you have the obligation to do so. When Joseph Smith sought information from others of his generation, when he went to other preachers and pastors and congregationalists, he not only didn't get satisfactory answers to his questions, but he was shot down and persecuted for having them and for claiming that he had anything more. Well, if we're going to seek truth, then there's a few things we've got to keep in mind. First, from the Lord, he commanded that there shall be no priest crafts. For behold, priestcrafts are that men preach and set themselves up for a light unto the world that they may get gain and praise of the world. 
but they seek not the welfare of Zion. Behold, the Lord hath forbidden this thing. Skipping a bit, for he doeth that which is good among the children of men. And he doeth nothing, save it be plain unto the children of men. And he inviteth them all to come unto him and partake of his goodness. And he denieth none that come unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and female. And he remembereth the heathen, and all are alike unto God, both Jew and Gentile. Therefore, if in your search for truth, you encounter anyone who would claim that they have the right to be the gatekeeper of your truth because they hold some keys or some authority or some position that dictates that they are in some way superior to you or entitled to tell you what you must believe and what you must not believe, you can put it down that they certainly are not in the employ of the Lord Jesus Christ because that is categorically against what he taught and what he expects of all of us. Something else to keep in mind. In the search for truth, sources matter. And if you want correct answers, you need correct information, which is sometimes hard to come by because organizations always have an agenda that's driven by the interests of the organization. And I need to let you know at the outset, (laughs) well, we're not in the outset, but I need to let you know at this point, your soul is important. Your salvation is important. Therefore, I would do you a disservice if I did not speak directly and declare truth. I would do you a disservice if I kind of fell into the pattern of something we all came from, which tells us to be kind of passive aggressive and put on a smile and not really say what we're thinking. I think better of you than that. And I'm frankly just going to say it as it is. And so please don't take offense at that because it's done in the spirit of love. And it's done in the spirit of Christ, who would do the same. So, when organizations have an agenda, that agenda, unfortunately, is first and foremost the survival and prosperity of the organization. When that organization is worth a trillion dollars and has multiple business interests and multiple interests in real estate holdings and multiple interests in all sorts of things that are not the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have to ask yourself, what's going to come first for that organization? This was brought home to me years ago. I actually, as it turns out, I'm a blogger and I I keep a blog. It's called To the Remnant. And that blogging started for me because of this book, which some of you may recognize. A friend and I were having a discussion back and forth, basically by email. And um, the friend was trying to convince me of certain points and I wasn't being convinced. And in order to be more convincing, my friend pulled out a bunch of quotes from Joseph Smith. And those quotes were all sourced from this manual. And the quotes were very convincing uh, that absolutely I was wrong and my friend was right and I needed to acquiesce and admit it uh, because otherwise, you know, I was contradicting the prophet Joseph Smith. And so I started to search down those quotes, look for the sources, find out what Joseph said, when he said it, who recorded it, how did it end up in our lesson manual, And what I found was lies, lies upon lies. I found things that Joseph was never verified to have said that were being presented as absolute facts and that my salvation hinged upon them. I found things that were at best apocryphal third-hand stories told 30 to 40 years after the fact and put in quotation marks as a direct quote, never written down from the prophet Joseph Smith as if it was the word of God himself. Well, That troubled me that whoever had put this manual together was being at best misleading and claiming Joseph Smith said things and claiming they had direct quotes from Joseph Smith that they clearly did not. And it was so pervasive that I started, that's what I started my blog. And I started writing about these things, writing about it's actually um, not a good idea to be dishonest in matters of salvation. It's not a good idea to prop up the organizational interests by putting words in Joseph Smith's mouth 30 or 40 years later and claiming he said it. Um, The organization, of course, didn't respond well to that. And for questioning a manual and refusing to take the blog down, I was excommunicated summarily and uh, told that, well, my membership was not welcome. 
And that's okay, because organizations also have the right to set up whatever rules they want about who gets to be part of the organization and who doesn't. What organizations don't get to do is control salvation, because the keeper of the gate is the Holy One of Israel, and he employeth no servant there. Therefore, anyone who claims to be that servant who can control the gate of salvation, you may know, is lying. Well, so it comes down to the elephant in the room, and here it is. The elephant in the room is this. It's the all or nothing concept that gets taught. Now, I served an LDS mission. I bet many in this room did, and you probably taught this. It goes something like this. I'd like you to read and pray about this Book of Mormon, and the Lord will give you a testimony and tell you that this book is true and that it came from God. And thus you may know that Joseph Smith the translator of the book, was a prophet of God. And thus you may know that the church that he started is God's only true church on earth. And thus you may know that 140 years later or 180 years later or however long it's been that the guy that currently is in charge at the top is a prophet, seer, and revelator because Joseph Smith was because the Book of Mormon's true and it's all or nothing. Because the Book of Mormon's true, then fill in the blank is a prophet. And it must be thus, and it cannot be otherwise. And furthermore, we cannot lead you astray. It's not in the Lord's program. If I were attempt to do were to attempt to do that, the Lord would strike me down. And that, that's taught. Therefore, we are to believe that the church is incapable of error and that it's all tied up in one package. Everything from the first vision to the existence of God to the atonement of Jesus Christ is all tied up in a package with an LDS label on it, and it is impossible to be wrong about any of it. So therefore, when you encounter historical dishonesty or inaccuracy or lies or abuse, it all goes down in flames because it's all true or none of it's true, right? And therein lies the problem. There sits the proverbial baby, and there's the bathwater. <laughs> and you know what's going to happen because too often we have been taught that you throw out the baby with the bathwater because it is all or nothing. And so when you find out about troubling things, too many select the nothing box and go off into agnosticism, atheism, a complete loss of faith. And it need not be that way. It need not be that way. Here's another one of those direct statements. Do not be offended. But if you have decided there is no God because of the actions of the LDS church, then the LDS church was your God. Now, don't feel badly about that because that makes you a good Mormon. And don't feel badly that I said the word Mormon because it's totally fine. <laughs> if, because you were doing what the church teaches, the church actually wants to be your God. The men at the top want you to focus on them. They've said so in general conference. They have said, keep your eyes on us. Therefore, you do. And the closer you look, you might find troubles. You might find things that bother you. And then, well, there are too many faith crises. And the problem is that, well, your faith is just too weak. I want to show you a different way. I want to mention one other thing, though, and that is confirmation bias. Too often in the situation where I see someone has uncovered troubling information and has therefore determined that for whatever reason the LDS church or the gospel or the restoration of the gospel is not true, the conversation goes something like this. I no longer believe in the LDS church because of historical inaccuracy. They've lied to me. Okay, fair enough. I no longer believe in Joseph Smith. He was a polygamist, you know. He had 35 wives. Well, how do you know that? Well, the LDS church says so. Look right here. I thought you said they were big liars. Are they lying about that too? I mean, you can't have it both ways. And so confirmation bias simply means cherry picking whatever information supports the conclusion you've already come to, regardless of the source of that information. And that is just as dangerous to finding truth as blind following is. Getting past the confirmation bias is really important. Today, then, let's talk about some ways past that. What if the church is not the gospel of Jesus Christ? 
What if the church can make mistakes, fail, get off track? What if men can fail in their responsibilities, can make mistakes, and that has no effect of, uh, on the gospel at all? What if the restoration through the prophet Joseph Smith is completely different than the organization called the church? A couple of scriptural thoughts. This is the Lord speaking. Yea, and I will also bring to light my gospel, which is ministered unto them. Behold, they shall not deny that which you have received, but shall build it up and shall bring to light the true points of my doctrine and the only doctrine which is in me, says the Lord. And this I do that I may establish my gospel, that there may not be so much contention. Yea, Satan does stir up the hearts of the people to contention concerning the points of my doctrine. And these things they do err, for they do rest the scriptures and do not understand them. Therefore, I will unfold to them this great mystery. Skipping a bit, the Lord says, Behold, this is my doctrine. Whosoever repenteth and cometh unto me, the same is my church. Whosoever declareth more or less than this, the same is not of me, but is against me. And therefore, he is not of my church. There is the Lord's definition of what his church is, and it is not an organization, and it is not a business interest, and it is not a huge bank account. It is people. People who repent and come unto Christ are his church, period. And he does not give permission to declare more or less than that. Keeping that in mind then, what if the point of the gospel is to redeem individuals then, not build an organization? What if Jesus Christ is not the author of all this confusion? Because this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. No mention of any need for an organization there either. And when we do find organizations, we find out that there are exactly two, only two. One is the church of the Lamb of God. That's the one I just spoke of, those who repent and come unto Christ. And the other, all other organizations, institutions, uh, promotions, all other focuses, all other desires, all other business interests, everything else is Babylon. It belongs to that great church the mother of abominations, the whore of all the earth, because it is not the church of Christ, which consists of those who repent and come unto him. Well, as an aside, the Book of Mormon is true, by the way. It's the most fundamental, important, prophetic book in the world pertaining to our day. If you have doubts or troubles about the Book of Mormon, I would encourage you to uh, spend some time following them through, because some of the arguments I've seen against the Book of Mormon are so specious, so silly, so absolutely transparent <clears throat> that I'm amazed people have the guts to make the arguments. I wish I had time to tell you the things that I've discovered from the Book of Mormon and in the work that I've done, which requires me to look at the text in, in a way that is um, extraordinarily detailed. I have found such remarkable things just in the construction of the text, such remarkable features. It's impossible for any of the non-divine explanations for that book to be anything but a joke. Well, regarding churches, the time speedily shall come that all churches that are built up to get gain, to get power over the flesh, and to become popular in the eyes of the world will be consumed as stubble. The Lord says, uh, excuse me, <laughs> the, well, the Lord says in the Book of Mormon, speaking through the prophet, all your churches have become, every one have become polluted. Why have you polluted the holy church of God? He thunders at us. And if we are to say, if we are to take at face value the claim that a certain organization is the holy church of God, by definition, it is polluted. There's more places you can look for more information. These will be in my, in my notes that are put up online. I highly recommend reading these passages in the Book of Mormon. But I said that this was about reasons for hope, and I'd like to give some reasons for hope. Here are, here are some. Number one, if you've become disaffected from the LDS church, this is a good thing because it means you're free to pursue, pursue truth, unencumbered by institutional requirements or obligations. Reason for hope number two is it also means you don't need to tie your hopes to an organization. Their actions, errors, and problems have no bearing on your relationship with God or your salvation. So what now? Let's look at the outline given by God. 
In Scripture, Lehi, Nephi, Jacob, Isaiah, Christ, Mormon, Moroni all tell a very similar story and speak uh, in very specific detail about the Lord's agenda, about what's called the Father's work, about what needs to be done in this creation before it all wraps up and the Lord returns to claim it as his own. The most fundamental, amazing statement of that is in a sermon given by Jesus Christ, which uh, is recorded in 3 Nephi. I've spoken elsewhere on it. This is a map of the sermon, just using Christ's words. And that is actually seven feet long, and it's sitting over there if anyone wants to look at it during the break. But this sermon explains the, the agenda for what will happen. Here it is in a nutshell. It starts with the gospel being restored among the Gentiles, and that's us. And you'll find out more about that when Matt Lohmeyer speaks. The Gentiles will largely reject what is offered, but a small remnant will repent and believe. And those believing Gentiles will receive a new covenant that numbers them with the house of Israel. These covenant Gentiles will then take the gospel message to the scattered remnants of Israel, including the Jews, initiating a restoration and gathering of Israel. There will be a temple built in the tops of the mountains. There will be a city of holiness established, a place of safety that is called the New Jerusalem. Believers will be gathered to New Jerusalem and to Old Jerusalem, and the Lord will return to reclaim his creation. Now, this is just the barest of outlines. There's a lot of detail in there, but I want to look at a couple of things going on to finish up what I'm speaking about today. Part one, the gospel restoration took place. It happened. Part two, the Gentiles largely rejected what is offered. Also true, both in and out of the church. The LDS church now is so far from what Joseph Smith established, it is so diametrically opposed on many points that it is unrecognizable. Joseph's last vision, his last dream, which if you've never read, you should look it up, was uh, the night before he died. And it was a dream about what would become of the church to the point that it was a dilapidated ruin that he wouldn't even recognize or want. Well, the believing Gentiles were to receive a new covenant numbering them with the house of Israel, and that's kind of where it stopped because within two years of the church being founded, we had the whole church under condemnation. And this condemnation, it says, rests upon the children of Zion, even all, and they remain under this condemnation until they repent and remember the new covenant, even the Book of Mormon. And the former commandments which I have given them, not only to say, but to do according to that which I have written, so that they can bring forth fruit, meat for their father's kingdom. Otherwise, there remains a scourge and a judgment to be poured out. This condemnation that the church was put under by the Lord shortly after the church was founded has not been lifted from the church. Ezra Taft Benson, in my lifetime, spoke about it and said, no, the church is still under condemnation. Okay, well, there you have it. Therefore, item three, the Gentiles receiving a new covenant, does not happen through a church that is under condemnation. It happens through believers who repent and come unto Christ, the definition of his church. And that is underway. These covenant Gentiles take the gospel message to the scattered remnants of Israel, including the Jews, initiating a restoration and gathering of Israel. Unfortunately, this cannot, this cannot, take place under the auspices of the LDS Church. In order to build the BYU Jerusalem Center on Mount Scopus in Jerusalem, the LDS Church signed an agreement with the State of Israel due to people being troubled that this was really just a front for proselytizing and trying to spread the gospel, and we can't have that. And so the LDS Church, over the signature of Howard W. Hunter, signed an agreement that there will be zero missionary activity in Israel. We will not share the gospel with the Jews. One of the two named groups that the Lord Jesus Christ said that the gospel must go to and that we have the obligation to take it to, we have a signed statement saying, not only will the church not do it, they will actively fight against it. If you go take a semester abroad at the BYU Jerusalem Center today, you will be required to sign an agreement that not only will you not share the gospel with anybody, anyone. You won't even answer questions. Somebody sees you in the street and says, hey, you a Latter-day Saint? I have a question. No, no, no. I am not allowed. It's a secret. I can't tell you the gospel. You're not worthy. 
So the Lord has this to say. Oh, ye Gentiles, have you remembered the Jews, mine ancient covenant people? Nay, but you have cursed them and have hated them and have not sought to recover them. Behold, I will return all these things upon your own heads, for I, the Lord, have not forgotten my people. Well, one thing that's been done independently of the LDS Church is the first and only version of the Book of Mormon specifically for the Jewish people, the stick of Joseph in the hand of Ephraim containing Hebraicized terms, Hebraicized understanding, appendices, describing the Hebraic nature of the book that was written by Jews for Jews. That's one thing that's been done outside of any church organization. Therefore, that obligation for the Gentiles, and there's other, there's other projects underway, but that obligation for the Gentiles then to take this message to the believing Jews or to take the message to the Jews and hopefully there will be some believing cannot be undertaken by a church, but that doesn't mean it won't happen. And that's a reason for hope. The prophecies are being fulfilled, both the negative and the positive. We see churches falling into darkness. We see the world falling into darkness. We see wars and rumors of wars. We see all of the problems prophesied, and that means necessarily that the positive prophecies are being fulfilled as well. The growing darkness gives evidence of the growing light. And because things are unfolding exactly as predicted. We can have faith that the positive things will unfold exactly as predicted, that the Lord will return, that there will be some group of people prepared to meet him at his coming. Reason for hope number four, the Lord's marvelous work continues and it will reach its successful conclusion, completion. It will do so outside any organization or church. That's just a fact. Organizations are interested in their organizational interests, not in fulfilling the prophecies. A couple of quick resources I'll point out before I close. Number one, I would urge you to go to the 10 talks.com. This is where you'll find 10 lectures, 10 talks that were delivered by Denver Snuffer in 2013 and 2014, specifically addressing what's going on with the LDS people and what the Lord is doing, and how his work is continuing, even if it's not continuing inside of a church organization. Uh, The other point I would point out is if you're interested in my blog, you can go to to toTheRemnant.com. I would recommend starting at the beginning because it covers a lot of the topics at the beginning that I spoke about today. And reason for hope number five, the last reason for hope I'm going to give is just this. You do not have to believe in or belong to any church to receive the Lord's covenant and to participate in his work now underway. There is a group of believers who have repented, who have turned to Christ, who have taken seriously the Book of Mormon, who have sought to recover his words, who are seeking to fulfill the prophecies, to recover the Jews, to recover the lost sheep remnants of Israel, to build a temple to establish the new Jerusalem, and to be prepared to welcome the Lord at his coming. The Lord is working. He does speak again. And although there are ample reasons to find troubles and problems with the church and troubles and problems with the history you've been taught, I invite you to reach out, to search out those questions that may bother you, to find out what Joseph Smith may actually have never said, taught, or done that's been pinned on him by those who came after wanting to prop up their own interests and give legitimacy to their own efforts. In closing, I simply want to testify, God lives. Jesus Christ is our Savior. He is reaching out to you and to me. He is calling out to us. For the last time, he has sent laborers into the vineyard. And soon, it will all be gathered the wheat into bundles, and the tares to be burned. Will you hear his voice? In closing, I asked the Lord if I had his permission to speak in his name today. And he gave permission with one proviso. Any errors, any mistakes, those are mine. Any truth or good that was said here today, was said in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.